Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 70 of the Computer Business Marketing Show. Today's episode is brought to you by Tech Blog Builder. Tech Blog Builder is the blog writing service for IT businesses. With Tech Blog Builder, you can get consistent, well-written, search engine optimized blog posts published directly on your website at an affordable and predictable monthly subscription rate. Learn more at techblogbuilder.com. On today's show, we have LinkedIn ad expert, AJ Wilcox, to explore the world of LinkedIn ads. We'll learn how LinkedIn ads differ from Facebook ads, how to make the ads get clicked, and how to target the right clients on LinkedIn. Plus, Paco shares some insights on how he's automating his customer scheduling and onboarding process. And we have a tech site builder question of the week about what content you should be putting on your homepage. All that and so much more coming up right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Computer Business Marketing Show. If you own or work in an IT services business, this is place. This is the place to learn how to get more clients, keep them happy, and grow your revenue. You can watch, download, and or subscribe to all show episodes at computerbusinessmarketing.com. You can also catch our live stream on Facebook every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Just be sure to like the Tech Site Builder Facebook page, click on the following tab, and select See First so that the live stream will jump on top of the feed. And uh, we love to see you guys in the live stream. Uh, we've got a, our usual suspects there hanging out with us now. And uh, it's a great place to ask questions and get them answered live on the air as we're doing the show. Modern technology. Gotta love it. So uh, our topic for today is going to be all about getting the most out of LinkedIn ads. So uh, previously on the show, we've talked about, you know, Google ads and AdWords, Facebook ads, um, other kind of advertising and marketing. And today we're going to focus on LinkedIn. We have in the past talked about LinkedIn as far as just a platform for generating leads. But now we're going to dig into uh, the, the advertising side of LinkedIn a little bit more and uh, figure out, you know, uh, how to best utilize that and, and see if it's a right fit for, for our businesses. Uh, before we jump into that, though, as always, I have my co-host here, Paco LeBron. Uh, Paco, what have you been up to these days? Yep, it's been a pretty busy week. Uh, we did quite a few things. I had one of my big clients decide to come over to our protection plan. So kind of as I was telling everyone last week, I am using Synchro MSP with Bitdefender. So we finally finished the migration over to all their endpoints. So that was fun. And I was able to talk to some of the members there kind of getting more um, integrated into their uh, to their daily process and kind of understanding the hierarchy and stuff. So right now they're just a retainer client. So they are not a monthly recurring client in the full fashion of the sense. Essentially they just pre-purchased a block of hours and they're paying per month for the software of the monitoring, AV patching, et cetera. So that was a good, uh, chunk of my time because I had to automate that process. I'm not sure if I talked about it too much last week, but essentially I used Mixmax. Um, to help me out with creating templates. And that allowed me to not only create a template with the links that I needed from Synchro to have them install, um, basically allowed them to reply back to let me know that they actually read the email and they actually replied back saying that it was done. I was able to look at the dashboard and then reply back with another template, letting them know we're all good. Just let us know if there's any problems. So that was a, it was fairly easy to do it that way. I'm sure there could have been a better and more automated way to do it, but it did cut down a lot of time from having to um, rewrite all those emails. And the really cool thing was, is I used actually Calendly with Mixmax. So basically I had everyone book their appointment through Calendly and then I was able to actually schedule the emails with Mixmax to let them know where, uh, when to install and so forth on their appointment. So I could be doing something completely else I see that the email calendar invite came up on my Google calendar, look at the dashboard and send out that migration uh, template, send right back out. So it worked out pretty well. Um, you know, it was really quick, uh, quick cut and dry, but could have probably got a little bit more automated than I wanted to, but it did the job so far. So Nice. Yeah. I love when, when you can automate those types of 
especially the client engagement pieces that either you, it's easy to forget or it's easy to kind of get overwhelmed, if, especially if you have like a bunch of clients contacting you at once. Um, it's easy to drop the ball or just get overwhelmed with that work. So it's cool to, to automate that stuff and then just kind of sit back and, and watch it happen. Yep. And uh, yeah, so it was quite, quite a few projects we actually had. Uh, we actually had a onsite with a potential customer. Um, he wants to virtualize everything from his own space to the cloud. Um, and I, so I have no idea how to do any of that. I know some stuff as far as with some of the services that I've used before. Um, but I have my colleague who's part of the company, um, Adrian. So he handles all my cloud stuff. So we both went down there and it was cool to see kind of how AWS works on that type of platform and how to really generate what they were looking for. Um, so we got a good possibility and it's one of those lessons where if you don't have that strength, it's usually you want to leverage your network and, you know, I've worked with uh, Adrian probably through five years ago for three years and, you know, the man knows his stuff. He's worked with global companies doing the same thing. So, um, this is a great opportunity for our business because now we can send the contract to the client if he chooses to, he's actually going to have to do all the work. And I'll go ahead and take the fee. So, <laughs> so I'll help my grant manage that project. But, you know, it's one of those opportunities to help grow your business. And these are one of those where if there's some areas you're not used to or just don't, you're not good at, it's, it's great to find people that have that strength to kind of move forward with that. So how do you handle that? Do you, are you transparent and say, hey, like this is a, a guy subcontracting for me? Or do you kind of present him as a member of the Prodigy Text team? So technically, he now is part of the Prodigy Text team. So he's one of my four people that I say are part of the company. Um, but I do say to them that he is a contractor because he does work a W-2. So it's just a matter of, you know, being transparent with the client. Um, but he, before he joined on, I did let uh, one of my clients know who helped me with some of the server migration that he's a colleague that's familiar with this that I'm bringing in. Um, but I had officially brought him in, you know, he's under our domain, has the email, represents the business. So, um, but we do introduce him as part of the company, but as a contractor for us. Yeah. And I think, um, I, I kind of had a hang up with that at first when I started bringing on contractors to help with certain things in my business that are, that are doing things that are going to be kind of client facing or interacting with the clients. And I would be a little hesitant to say, you know, hey, this is a, a, a contractor that isn't an employee under my company. But eventually I got comfortable with it, number one, because most of the time clients don't care just as long right. as you're solving their problem or whatever. Sometimes they are, are curious or they want to know and you, and then you just let them know and, and it's, it's never been a problem. Um, I, I think they just, if they do like to know, they just, you know, they like to know because they're curious about uh, how, how your business is running or, or who, you know, who, you, you know, is, is you're sending to their officers doing the work just to make sure that they kind of have an understanding of what that relationship is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's off. And it's also a delicate subject too, because when they ask you, Hey, how, what's the size of your business? And for those that you have, let's say referral partners, you know, the bigger companies that are referring work to you or just somebody that's done a lot of work with you over the years, Hey, have you grown? Hey, have you added more people on? And for those that are, you know, don't want to add more people specifically, you know, and are okay with the size that they are, but they're able to manage that. It's, it's kind of, you have to be good with your delivery on how to explain that to the customer. So they don't feel like, man, you know, we're investing in this company. He stayed stagnant after all these years. But in reality, there's been an investment in technology and systems so that there's no need to add more personnel. Right. And I guess uh, another thing you want to avoid is the, the, the thing that sometimes happens when you like hire a company to do work on your house and then they end up like subcontracting it to another company that, and you're like caught off guard and, and you don't know who these people are. Right. Um, and, and I think that might be part of like my hesitation to tell my customers that I had a contractor working for me. But I think as long as you stay involved and you're still the face and, and you're, you know, involved in all the communications and stuff, then that shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, exactly. As long as you're managing the project, it should be fine. And especially if you're bringing in someone that has their own company, it's always great to, it's always better to be transparent about that versus just saying that they're part of your own thing and they show up in their own shirt, you know? Right. 
Um, yeah, so that's kind of uh, how our uh, week has went. We did take over a network that had a couple of ruckus devices. Um, so it was a little bit of a learning curve for me because I've only dealt with uh, other brands like Open Mesh, Arachnus. And, you know, it was, a, it was a good learning curve. It was a, I was able to determine a lot of their Wi-Fi issues. And it would turn out that it just happened to be on some really old firmware. So we ended up updating them. And now they're humming along from last I heard from them this past Tuesday. And they've been plagued with Wi-Fi issues galore. So Nice. Yep. So that's, uh, that's all I got on my end. And uh, we'll see how uh, the remainder of the week for tomorrow goes. Yep. The week's not over. All right, cool. Um, so before we move on, just want to remind you guys about the Computer Business Marketing Newsletter. Uh, you can get that in your inbox every week, and that is a weekly newsletter that uh, will give you the latest, uh, the link to the latest podcast episode, as well as uh, a curated list of some marketing news and blog posts and content from around the internet that we curate specifically for you guys uh, that we think you guys will enjoy. And then we also give you the latest uh, posts from the Facebook group. And we end all of the, uh, the newsletters with a tip of the week to uh, kind of just, you know, maybe give you that extra insight or that extra motivation to get you through the week and help you uh, to up your marketing game for your IT business. You could sign up for that for free. Just head, over, head on over to computerbusinessmarketing.com. And there's a form right there at the top of the page to sign up for the newsletter. All right. Um, so Paco, uh, let's see, do you have a question for me for the tech site builder question of the week? But I do. So tech site builder question of the week is when creating your homepage. And obviously we want to try and get as much relevant information to our potential customer. Is it best to have one long page with a bunch of stuff and you have as they scroll down to kind of figure out stuff or is it best to have just one pane where you basically, once they get onto the website and then have links or boxes or buttons, whatever it may be to get to other sections, creating another step in that funnel per se to get what they're looking for. Yeah, that, um, that is a question that I don't really have a strong opinion on. Honestly, okay. um, it's, it, there's pros and cons to each approach. Um, I kind of like having, uh, I, I kind of like doing both. So I like having the homepage being almost a summary of all the different areas of your website. So, you know, if you have a services page, then maybe you can list a few of your services on the homepage or say, Hey, you know, we, we cover a wide variety of services, click here to learn more. And then another section saying, uh, you know, people love working with us here, are a few testimonials, click here to read more. And then, hey, about, you know, about the company or about the founder, here's a brief few sentences about us. If you want to learn more, click here. So it kind of gives them, you know, they can scan the homepage, find the information they're looking for, and then jump to maybe a more detailed view of that particular, uh, that particular topic. Um, recently, I've kind of uh, been moving to the, uh, the opinion that as far as like for SEO, um, you don't really want to worry about targeting your homepage for SEO. I, I like to find uh, subpages to focus on different keywords. And then your homepage could really be focused on your brand name, right? That's, you know, whatever the name of your company is, that's going to be kind of the, the target keyword for your homepage. And then anything else like computer repair or network, you know, diagnostics or virus removal or whatever, flesh that out on one of your services pages and really put a lot of content on there. Uh, and then that way you can, uh, it'll help you be able to target multiple keywords um, and not have to worry about stuffing it all on the homepage. The homepage could just be a nice landing page for people who either are looking for your business name or happen to stumble on you uh, through social media or something like that and they can find out more about you. Um, so so that's, that's kind of where I would go with that. Sounds good. Cool. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the interview today. So today we have uh, our guest, AJ Wilcox. He is a LinkedIn ad expert and the founder of B2 Linked. And he's going to talk to us about getting the most out of LinkedIn ads. How are you doing today, AJ? Doing awesome. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to share. Well, I will spill all the beans about LinkedIn ads. <laughs> 
Uh, not going to hold any beans back, huh? No beans being held. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. All right. So uh, before we dig into LinkedIn ads, why don't you just give us kind of a, a brief uh, history of the man and what uh, brought you to the point where you are today? The man, the myth, the legend. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've been doing digital marketing for about the last 12 years. I started out life as a, as a little SEO guy and learned Google ads, um, really fell in love with that. And then I, I went to a company about six years into my career where uh, on my very first day, I went and talked to the CMO and I laid out all of my marketing plans and she was like, okay, all that sounds great. Go ahead and execute. But just so you know, we started a pilot using LinkedIn ads. So see what you can do with it. And of course I saluted and said, yes, ma'am, absolutely. And I walked out of her office and went, what have I gotten myself into? I've never even heard of LinkedIn ads. Mm -hmm. And of course, not wanting to look like an idiot to my brand new boss, I went and dove into the platform. And about two weeks later, I had a sales guy come up to me and he said, hey, AJ, it's nice to meet you. By the way, we're fighting over your leads over here. You know, whatever you can do to, to keep these coming, keep it up. And I was like, what leads are you talking about? And I, I went and logged into Salesforce, our CRM at the time, and looked at all these leads. And all of the ones that he was talking about were dispositioned as source LinkedIn. And I went, oh, maybe there's something to this. Yeah. So long story short, over the course of the next two and a half years, I built up that account to become LinkedIn's largest spending account. And then after two and a half years there went, okay, well, there's no one else doing anything with LinkedIn ads. Maybe that should be me. And I went and started BT LinkedIn. We're an ad agency that sole, our sole focus is LinkedIn ads. Wow. Interesting. So how long ago was it that you started on kind of the LinkedIn ad journey? Uh, it's probably been about seven years ago and I started out, uh, about four years ago out on my own with B2 linked. Okay. So I'm curious what, what has changed with, uh, LinkedIn ads in that time? Cause I know, you know, these days, I mean, it's month by month that things are changing with some of these platforms. And I know I, I did experiment with LinkedIn ads quite a few years ago. And I remember at that time it was, it was, it was a little cumbersome and I, I couldn't figure out how the only place I could put an ad was like way down in the sidebar and it was like really hidden. And, and so that kind of turned me off, but I'm sure, you know, now things have changed a lot. So I, I'm just curious to get your take on what some of the things that have changed over that time have been. Yeah. Well, it's funny you bring that up because that was really when I started um, having most of my success was in those days where the platform was absolute garbage. And I would talk to the, to the product team and say, Hey, by the way, you guys don't have conversion tracking. Like, Marketers actually want that. And, and it felt like I was pushing, an, like fighting an uphill battle, trying to teach them that they should have conversion tracking. And I remember it took about two and a half years of them saying, hey, we're going to do a platform update. You know, what do you want to, to have in that? Two and a half years later, they, they bring it out. So it was a very slow moving platform back then. But now, uh, I mean, we've had three platform updates, like complete visual changes in a year and a half. And tons and tons of new features being rolled out every quarter. So uh, they finally have the fire lit under them. <laughs> nice. Sounds like uh, you had some, some role in that as well. I, you know, I, I like to think I did because <laughs> they bring me in for, for uh, product feedback. But realistically, you know, two thirds of the feedback that I give uh, is like, hey, you really shouldn't do that. And then two months later, it gets released to the public and they didn't take my advice. So, oh, well, we'll see. <laughs> right. So, um, Coming at it from like my perspective and probably a lot of our listeners perspective of folks who really haven't done much with LinkedIn advertising, but maybe have dabbled in Google ads and Facebook ads. What are some of the key differences for, uh, between LinkedIn ads and some of those other ad platforms? Yeah. So if you're talking about Google ads specifically, it's very search focused, which means there's an intent coming into the query. And so if you're if you're comparing anything search versus anything social, your sales team is going to give you thing, give you feedback like, or, or you know, when you, if you're handling the calls coming in or the emails coming in, um, you're going to see requests that are like, hey, I'm ready to close tomorrow. Like, I'm looking for your service and you have it. Let's do this. So you have these deals that close very quickly. The downside is anyone can type a keyword. And so you might have the CEO of a company contacting you or it might be the janitor proverbial or anything in between. Um, so a lot of sales teams will say, Hey, search leads, they're not the highest quality, but they're usually hot and ready versus social. We can, we don't get a chance to target, um, what someone's looking for, but we get a chance to target, uh, who they are and their propensity and ability to buy. So on LinkedIn specifically, we can say, Hey, 
you know, if we're selling HR software, for instance, I'm going to only show this to HR managers and above at tech companies with more than 500 employees. So you can get so very specific mm -hmm. and they may not be looking for what you're doing. They might just have a passing interest, but you're getting in touch with exactly the right people who are going to close those really big deals. That's interesting. And I think that's a kind of a key differentiator from Facebook as well, because Facebook is, you know, full of your grandmas and your moms and your kids and your cousins and all, all sorts of folks. And a lot of, even if your target, even if you're able to, you know, target your, your target client on Facebook, they're visiting Facebook to hang out and maybe look at baby pictures and stuff. And they might not be in the, the business mindset. Whereas uh, I'm assuming on LinkedIn, most people use LinkedIn to, you know, they're, they're in the, during the workday and they're kind of in that business mode. Exactly. And make no mistake about it. Your clients, if you're in a business to business space, your clients are on Facebook. The challenge is like 4% of them are even putting in their job title and company information in. So mm -hmm. they're there, but good luck reaching them because they haven't made themselves able to be reached. And just like you said, they're not in the right mindset. Whereas on LinkedIn, when we very first created our profile, we told them what our job title was and we told them what company we work for and what skills we have. And we joined groups around certain ideas. And so people are coming in and declaring themselves. So now instead of having access to only 4% of your audience, we've got access to 95% or whatever. Very cool. So say, say we want to get started with LinkedIn ads. What, what are, where should we start? Should we start with uh, a test ad? Should we think about, you know, the messaging we want to get across? What, what's a good place to start? All right. So I've got an acronym for you. You ready for this? Right, it's a three letter acronym. AMO. Audience, message, and offer. So here's what you want to think about. LinkedIn is beautiful for the targeting. So the A, the audience, is pretty easy to define. You can define them by their job title, their seniority, their uh, groups they're members of, skills, industry, company size, all of that. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Your M is the message. So this is how they actually see the ad. Um, you know, what the image you used was, what your ad copy was. More or less simple. I mean, you don't have to go crazy on an image. And your ad copy is essentially distilling down whatever you're offering to someone. So again, no big deal. Um, you can pull that together no matter who you are. Oh, the offer is by far the make or break. It's the most important part of any campaign. Mm. And the reason why is because if you put an ad up there that just says, here, this is what we do. Talk to our high pressure sales rep. No one has any reason to click that ad. They weren't looking for you. You're just bothering them. And right. so that ad is not going to get a very high, what we call relevancy score. If you're used to Google, uh, a quality score, it's going to get a bad relevancy score and it's just going to go away. LinkedIn's going to say, Hey, we can make more money showing someone else's ad. So yeah, what, what you want to do is have an offer that is truly attractive, something that either solves a big pain point for your audience or satisfies a major curiosity. And if you can give that to them in some format where they're willing to give up their personal information for it, like join this free webinar or download this free ebook or guide or checklist or cheat sheet, something like that is, uh, you know, if it's valuable, people will be willing to submit their information and then you can then use that information to follow up with them and start a conversation and relationship and hopefully a certain percentage of those, a certain percentage of those turn into deals. Right. And that sounds like, um, you know, uh, the, the LinkedIn ads are not the place to say, you know, hey, buy my service for X number of dollars, click here. It's, it's uh, more a place to, you know, have, like you said, free offers or webinar offers or, you know, learn, learn, learn more or get this download or something like that to get folks on your list where then you can uh, continue to, um, you know, curate that, uh, that relationship and build that relationship with them. Yeah, it's totally an, a, a relationship play, not a transaction play. Yeah. And it's, I mean, and one of the pieces that, that I want to highlight that you said was a lot of us always try to make sure when we hear make an offer, we always have in our mind that it has to solve a pain point, but you made a good point on saying not only a pain point, but to help trigger their curiosity. And I think that's a big point that I want to highlight on that one, because a lot of us are really trying to figure out, okay, how do we solve pain points? But if we can get them curious enough to click on it, that could be equally as successful as well. Yeah, we had a really successful campaign that did just that. It was targeting marketing directors and VPs and, and CMOs. And we found that when we 
put an offer out there. We were trying all kinds of different offers. We tried one that was like defining what programmatic advertising was. And it was a, a, a guide that's like, this is what programmatic advertising is and how to think about it and how to implement it into your own strategy. And those marketing leaders, and this was back in probably 2016, uh, marketing leaders were downloading this like crazy, willing to give up their information for it because they would go to conferences and, and you know, their peers would talk about programmatic this, programmatic that, and they didn't know what it was and they were embarrassed. But we give them this nice and easy to digest piece of content that just defined it. And that was the most successful piece of content we had for that audience. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to dig a little bit into the, uh, the A in ammo, the audience, because uh, this is something I haven't, um, you know, had an experience with. So I'm just curious uh, what type of targeting LinkedIn lets you do, how, how drilled down you can get, and maybe some, some tips or tricks you have around, um, you know, finding the, the particular audience you're looking for. Yeah, well, I automatically, anytime someone's telling me about who they go after, mentally I'm splitting them up into two separate groups. So what I'm trying to understand is who the person is and then what type of company they're at. Because if you say, I'm selling software to CFOs, I go, great, how expensive is that software? If it's $1,200 a month, you're not going to sell to a CFO of a two-person company. Um, you will want to sell to a CFO of a 50-person company or a 200-person company. So, so splitting them into two separate groups, we have the professional his or herself. And these are things that we can target by job title, by what department they're in. LinkedIn calls this job function. Their level of seniority, so whether they're a manager, a director, a VP, CMO, an individual contributor called senior, uh, entry level, you have access to all of those. Um, also skills they have listed in their, in their profile or groups that they're members of. And so that's how I'm trying to define the individual. Like, this is your, your skill set. Then we pop over to the company side. So we can define the industry that the company is in. We can define the size of company, so the number of employees they have. And then one really cool one that people don't really use to its fullest extent is we can target by company name. That means if you've got like a list, a target list of here are the five clients that I would die to work with, you could put together an ad and show only to those companies, the, the right people at those companies. So nice. you define who they are, you define uh, the type of company that they're at, and then you have a, fun, a bunch of other stuff too, like what school they went to and the degree they got and uh, their gender and geography, you have all these things that you can layer on top. But those are the two main things, who they are and what type of organization they're at. Now, is there any advantage to using the sales navigator that LinkedIn pushes or can you get away with using just LinkedIn's built-in functionality? Oh, great question. So this, this answer is going to change uh, at some point. Right now, there's no integration between sales navigator and LinkedIn ads. So, um, if you're willing to pay LinkedIn ads prices, then you get access, full access to their entire audience, the entire suite of tools. And having Sales Navigator is not either a benefit or a disadvantage. However, in the future, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm going to. Uh, if anyone from LinkedIn is listening, just please don't hurt me. Um, uh, in the future, they're going to have like a direct connection between Sales Navigator. So if you have a sales team who is adding specific profiles to, to an audience, you can then show specific ads to that audience. So that's coming. I, 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 it might be quarters, months, maybe even over a year, but that kind of functionality is coming. Gotcha. I can see that being super powerful when, when that rolls out. That's going to be a game changer for sure. Yeah. I mean, I haven't been to an organization yet where marketing and sales aren't butting heads somehow. And this really puts it together. It's like sales, if you want us to show ads to the right people, add them to the audience and we will go after exactly who you're trying to define. So it, it, this could be a bridge build between both departments that are oftentimes fighting. Now, are you able to retarget with LinkedIn ads? Yeah. The retargeting on LinkedIn is quite frankly, very weak. Uh, it's cookie based only and iOS devices don't carry cookies. So immediately half your audience is, is incapable of being retargeted, mm -hmm. uh, but it does exist. Uh, there is a slight discount off of your cost per click when you're using it. So there's no reason not to. Uh, but what I do recommend is your traffic that you send from LinkedIn, you know who these are. These are the most highly qualified people that you want to work with. Make sure that your Facebook and your Google retargeting are picking them up. Those platforms have a better technology. They're more um, 
more pervasive. They will reach all the way around the net and all um, and all the way around like most of the social channels your prospects are using, which is Facebook and Instagram. Um, and they'll do it for a, a much lower price. So make sure you send the right traffic from LinkedIn and then really nurture it through your other channels for a big discount. Makes sense. I like that. Uh, all right, let's jump over to the to the M in ammo message. Uh, just, you know, really quick, um, like you said, that, you know, this is kind of up to the individual business and, and, you know, your personality and stuff. But is there anything you found over your time that you've spent uh, creating LinkedIn ads uh, as far as images to use or, you know, wording or, you know, some people like throw in little emoticons and stuff in there, anything that kind of helps uh, get more clicks? Yeah, so first off, LinkedIn has four separate ad units that if you go and log in, um, you'll get to choose one of four formats. So the one that we kind of jokingly referred to earlier, those are called text ads. They show up only on a, a desktop machine, so not on your mobile. They're over in the right rail, and it's a three-pack of ads, a little square that's 300 pixels wide by 250 tall, three little like micro ads inside, and the cool part about this is really that it's desktop traffic. If you have a landing page that's not mobile friendly, this is the best ad format to use. And it's also the least expensive way to use LinkedIn ads. Uh, you'll, you'll pay, you know, usually between three and $5 per click and, um, and you can pay all the way down to two. So that's text ads. That was the first one that came out. Then in 2013, LinkedIn came out with their user feed that was very similar to what Facebook had pioneered. And now because we have a user feed, we have sponsored content. So a, a news feed ad. Um, these I still call their halo ad unit. This is what we recommend for 95% of advertisers to use is using sponsored content. Your cost per click is going to range somewhere between about six and $9, uh, which is much higher than say Facebook. Um, but it's, it's an ad unit that is built for sharing content. So if you've got a, a white paper, a webinar, an in-person event, something you're, you're introducing, this is exactly the right ad unit for you. Um, then a couple years ago, we got sponsored in-mail. So this is not like the other ones where you pay per click, mm -hmm. but this one you pay per send. So you, you pay, it's usually 35 to 85 cents to send it to someone's inbox. It only arrives when they're active on LinkedIn and logged in and, and all that so they can see it come. Um, and this one, I probably only recommend about, you know, 5% of advertisers use uh, just because it, it really should, feel, like your offer should feel like a personal invitation if it's coming in the form of an email. Otherwise, it just looks like spam. Uh, and then actually this week, as of recording, we've got a new ad format and it's called uh, dynamic ads. And this is one where you can actively put the, the person who you're advertising to, it sticks their face in with another mm -hmm. picture you have and a call to action. So oh, cool. can be a little bit creepy to be like, wait, <laughs> how, why are you using my face in your ad? Uh, but when people understand that it's, it's all dynamic, um, we usually have a little giggle about it. And they'll, they'll, they'll draw their eye to it for sure. Yep, that's what they like. So, uh, yeah, in terms of like what types of ads tend to work, you want to use images that have a contrasting color scheme. So LinkedIn, just like Facebook, is very blue, gray, and white co color schemes. So if you can use accents that are red, purple, green, orange, yellow, those are going to help your image stand out. And what that does is it gets people to actually look at your ad copy. So now the onus is on you to write ad copy that actually gets people interested in what, what you have. Um, we've also noticed that when you're, you're sharing different motivations in your ads, you can try fear-based, like if you don't do this, something bad's going to happen. Or you can have aspirational-based, like uh, you can look like the hero if you do this. We found that aspirational messaging works way better than negative messaging on LinkedIn. Every once in a while we find you know, uh, a case where that's not the case, but, um, and then we also that found makes sense because, you know, LinkedIn is an aspirational place, right? You're going there to true. improve your career or try to, you know, network with more people and, and, and climb the ladder. So I, I can see where, where that would be, uh, that would work better there. Totally. And then uh, the last piece of advice I have is keep it short. We've tried lots of things where we try to be like double meanings of words and get cutesy and uh, that kind of thing. Um, it doesn't work. People are, are moving with speed through LinkedIn because they, they've got a mission in mind. So make sure that it's, you're telling them exactly what you want them to get out of it. It's short and it's sweet and 
they'll reward you if it's bite-sized and consumable. Great. So uh, what are some other tips or tricks you have for us kind of LinkedIn ad newbies um, that, uh, or, or maybe, you know, once we get started, what are some things we should be looking for as we're trying to optimize our ads and get better return on investment? Yeah. Well, what you want to look for is, uh, in my mind, I think of this as hurdles. So your very first hurdle you've got to get people over is, can you get people to look at your ads and want to click? And if you, if your click through rate is high enough, uh, to give you an idea, sponsored content is probably where you want to start. It's the biggest ad unit and the least expensive for the amount of volume you can get. Um, if you have a click through rate that's higher than 0.35%, then you're above average, you're doing great. So you're not having trouble getting people over that first hurdle. Um, so yeah, that's, that's hurdle one. number one. Hurdle number two is you're getting enough people to your landing page or to your offer or to look at your form, but if they're not converting, they're having trouble getting over the second one. So based off of where you're seeing troubles, if, if it's the first hurdle, you can change ad copy, try a new image, try changing maybe to something more aspirational in your message, get them over hurdle number one. Hurdle number two, if they're not converting, maybe your offer isn't attractive, maybe your landing page sucks. Um, or maybe some combination of the two. So figure out where your issue is and, you know, tackle the metrics or, or tackle the things that affect those metrics. I know a huge pet peeve of mine in my own ad ex clicking experience is when I click on an ad and then when I arrive on the landing page, then the landing page is not congruent with the ad I just clicked on. Whether the offer is different or even the, the imaging or the company name sometimes the, fa the name of the company on Facebook is different than the, the name of the website I land on. And that's usually a huge turnoff and something, you know, a lot of people don't think about. Or yeah. even trying to find it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And everyone who lands there is like, come on guys, this is marketing 101. It makes you look really bad. <laughs> right. Yep. Exactly. Cool. Uh, Paco, did you have any other questions? Uh, no, as far as like optimizing and controlling costs is kind of the one that you had uh, asked because I think uh, the biggest piece is one, trying to get started and then two, just understanding like what is the set budget that we should really go into. Like I, I remember when I was uh, watching your um, webinar with SEM Rush, you kind of specified out like, look, if you're trying to attract these type of organizations, it may not be worth it for you to go through this path. But if you are going to go through this path, these are the things you want to come in mind um, as far as budget is concerned. Um, I guess if you want to elaborate a little bit more like that, as far as, you know, you know, is LinkedIn great for trying to acquire small businesses slash to bigger companies or kind of, you know, in that aspect of it, of another platform or just, you know, the SEO process, kind of like what you, you said that could be applied to other things. Love it, Paco. Yeah, th this is uh, a really important point about LinkedIn ads is when you compare it to other platforms, it can seem very expensive. I mean, I, I told you some of the quotes on this cost per click where you know, you'd be paying three to nine dollars. There are some people paying even, you know, 11, 12 dollars a click. And that is really high if you're used to maybe much of Google ads and basically anything on Facebook is going to be less expensive than that. Um, this isn't normally a challenge, but what it means is you've got to have a large enough return on your investment or a large enough deal size on the back end to make paying that much for traffic up front worthwhile. So the line in the sand we've drawn is if you're going to make $15,000 or more from the lifetime of a deal, then LinkedIn ads make sense near 100% of the time. If you, if you stand to make much less, maybe LinkedIn ads is going to be too expensive for you. Maybe they've just priced themselves out of the market for your business, uh, but it may be worth considering. As you're planning your budget, you can plan your daily budget caps in LinkedIn just like you can Facebook and Google. So if you say, hey, my budget this month is $3,000, you can go into your campaign and say, don't spend more than $30 a day or Set it where I can't do maths, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, set a daily budget cap. Um, yeah, th does that answer the question pretty well? Yeah, and I think you know to drive it home too for on the on the question is for everyone to actually try it out, right? Like look at your look in your area, how much Google ads are working, how much is going to be the Facebook ads and LinkedIn ads. So for me, I'm from I'm in downtown Chicago. I'm in the West Loop, which is a very high popular area. For my area, it's $100 a click for Google Ads. So in that case, and for the specific term of IT support, MSP, et cetera. So 
I'm not throwing $100 on a gamble of a click, whereas in LinkedIn, I can gamble five clicks, six clicks, and hope that one or two are going to hit if I have the right you know, ammo for being able to get them to come and convert. Yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, oftentimes, there are industries where Google clicks are crazy. Like if you're in law, um, and, and I'm not saying that law does particularly well on LinkedIn either, but there are clicks that are you know, hundreds of dollars per click in the law industry. Whereas on LinkedIn, almost no matter what audience you're going after, you're probably never going to pay more than about, you know, 10 or 11 bucks a click unless you're, you have massive budgets and can afford to bid really high. So yeah, really good point about, uh, you know, compare it to what you're paying on search. Yeah. And I think this, this, uh, you know, the, the mindset that, that our audience should have coming into uh, LinkedIn is this is a place to get some of those, uh, especially for those folks who are having trouble maybe breaking into uh, MSPs or really fleshing out their MSP offerings, trying to get more small business clients, get those bigger businesses that are going to have, um, you know, multiple uh, end users and endpoints and, and you want to start building up your resume of those types of companies, but you just haven't been able to get your foot in the door or you're not sure where to look. I think LinkedIn would be a great place to, to start looking um, and, uh, and start targeting some of those bigger companies um, and getting, getting yourself out there, you know, just, just target, like, like you mentioned, you could target a business name. So if there's a couple big players in your area, you start showing ads to their employees and then you can follow that up with, you know, going to networking events and talking to them face to face or, you know, uh, doing some cold calling or some email outreach. Uh, so LinkedIn could be kind of a way to get your company in top of mind to those folks. And then you could follow that up. Uh, with other other things to kind of seal the deal. Um, and that would be a great way to kind of uh, get your foot in the door to some of those bigger clients that you might have trouble finding out how to reach otherwise. And Matt, that's a perfect point. I like to think of LinkedIn ads as my sniper rifle, whereas mm. Facebook is like my shotgun. <laughs> and so you don't have to go to LinkedIn and say, hey, I've got a $15,000 budget this month. How about you just do exactly what you said and say, here's a list of the 10 companies that I would absolutely love to do work with. I'm going to show ads only to them. And maybe it only spends $8 a day or $2 a day, but those are clicks that are, you know, super, super worthwhile, especially if those eventually turn into one of, you know, the, a deal for you that you can now put their logo on your website as we work with Adobe or whatever that, that brand is that you're trying oh, to Yeah, in. exactly. Yep. And that, that's, uh, we, we, I just posted something in the uh, Facebook group a, a little while ago talking about if you ever get interviewed by your local news affiliate, um, uh, you know, like the local NBC station, if, if you do, you could take that NBC logo, put it on your website and say, as seen on NBC. And, you know, that'll uh, be a cool way to add some of that kind of uh, big credibility to, to your website. And this is the same way. If you can get your foot in the door to some of these big companies in your area um, and, and get a testimonial or case study out of it, um, that could continue to go a long way to driving more of those types of customers and making it a lot easier to get more of those types of customers. I got to start doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a great note on, on uh, social proof. I, I was talking to a conversion optimization expert and you know, he, he gave me a list of here are the 132 motivations that can inspire someone to take an action. And I was like, eh, cut through all those 132. What's the best? What's the most important? And without fail, it's, social proof. So oh, yeah. if, if they can see you've been featured on the news, oh, and you've been, um, your clients are X, Y, and Z brand that they recognize, instantly you're going to have a two, three, four times higher conversion rate and a probably that high of a close rate compared to if you didn't have anything. Great. Well, I think that's a, a great place to end it. Um, we're about out of time here, but uh, AJ, do you, uh, is there a good place for folks to reach out to you, get more info, or if they want to maybe pick your brain a little bit more? Yeah, I've got a little bit of a secret. If you go to b2length.com, our website, and you fill out the form on, on that site, uh, it doesn't go to a sales rep, and it doesn't put you into a, a marketing email nurture sequence. Uh, you go directly to my inbox, and I am not a sales guy. So you can ask any question you want about LinkedIn ads. I'm also really active on Twitter. If you go to... Um, and you know, chat me up. Wilcox AJ is my handle. Uh, I respond to everything. So uh, if you've got questions, I've got answers. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. It'd be great to have you on next time or just to talk about more like structures on how to manage these campaigns. Like, cause like, you know, 
like you said, being able to have all these ad types, trying to figure out so it's not a big blob on trying to keep track of it, I think would be a great opportunity for us to talk to you again to how to manage the hierarchy and framework on those LinkedIn ads too. Oh, and I've got definite opinions on that. So I'm super happy to come back and share. Excellent. Perfect. Uh, and one last question. Do you, uh, is there anyone that you can think of off the top of your head that might be a good guest on the show? Ooh, uh, have you interviewed Chris Daly from Daily Conversion? Or sorry, he's, he's with Disruptive Advertising. I have not. Uh, I, I will, I'll make an email intro if that sounds interesting. But he's yeah. a conversion optimization expert. Ooh, he's all about that. take an experience on the, on the website and get more people to fill, it out, fill out the form and convert. That would be cool. I think, yeah, I think that's, that's something that we definitely need to talk about on this show. So perfect. Well, AJ, I I appreciate it. Uh, Lots of great info, lots of actionable info, and it's definitely um, going to prompt me to hop into LinkedIn and take a look at uh, some of the uh, new things they've been doing with their ad platform. Awesome. Well, uh, watch often because, you know, five or six new features are coming out every month. So it's, it's breakneck speed now. Excellent. And we'll definitely uh, have you back in the future to, to dig a little bit deeper. Okay, sounds great. Thanks so much for having me on and thanks everyone who's listening. All right, guys. So uh, that's going to do it for this episode of the Computer Business Marketing Show. Uh, I do, before we leave, want to mention our sponsor for today and that is Tech Blog Builder. Tech Blog Builder is a place you can go for uh, blog posts for your computer business. If you're having trouble getting new clients uh, for your IT business, uh, one of the ways that you can help that is to publish regular blog posts. It's one of the most effective ways to attract a following of potential customers and build loyalty among your existing clients. You can use the posts from Tech Blog Builder on your website, in your newsletter, in social media, in videos, in ads, etc. With Tech Blog Builder, you can get consistent, well written, search engine optimized blog posts published directly on your website uh, at an affordable and predictable monthly subscription. Um, So check out what Tech Blog Builder has to offer at techblogbuilder.com. Also, don't forget to join us in the Facebook group. That's completely free. Just go to techsitebuilder.com slash group or just search computer business marketing in Facebook. Uh, That is the Facebook group where it's all happening, where you can learn Um, tips and tricks and ask questions about different advertising uh, and uh, and marketing that you're doing for your computer business and lots of smart folks. Um, We're just shy of a thousand right now, folks in that group that can help you grow your IT business. And then, uh, of course, let's keep the conversation going over at computerbusinessmarketing.com. There's a comment section there on the show notes page if you're listening to this on iTunes. Um, you know, if you have something you want to, to, to chime in on, head on over to computer business marketing, go to the comments section under this episode and let us know what you're thinking. Also, don't forget, um, that Facebook group. Uh, we can't wait to see you there as well. And if you listen to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, be sure to give us a shout out and leave a review. We'd love to hear your feedback and every comment helps so that the podcast can be found by others. Finally, don't forget to check out our sponsor, Tech Blog Builder. Thanks for checking out the Computer Business Marketing Show. My name is Matthew Rodella. And this is Paco LeBron. Saying here's to your success.